new videos every day. Hi, I'm Roddy Aglis. I'm a certified clinical nutritionist, and if you've been following my series lately, um, I want to bring you back. We're going into category three, which is hyperacidity. Now, if you're not familiar with it, I want you to go back to the videos previous to this and look for the one that says how the body works because that's the beginning of this series and you're going to want to know this information. Just to recap a little bit, um, I want to talk about remember how the body works. It's not just eating good food, but it's how well do we digest, how well do we absorb, how well do we utilize the food, and how well do we get rid of the waste product. All right, so um, remember, just to recap, we started back in the mouth. Digestion starts in the mouth, goes down the esophagus into the stomach. Once it goes into the stomach, it goes into the small intestine where the pancreas releases digestive enzymes and eventually the liver releases bile so that we can break all this food down. So this is the first part of digestion. It's broken down into, for example, proteins broken down into amino acids and fat broken down into lipids. Um, or fatty acids and um, carbohydrates eventually broken down into monosaccharides that eventually become glucose. All right, so we've talked a little bit uh, in the last, in the previous video, videos about hypochlorhydria, um, which is low or insufficient hydrochloric acid. So today we're going to talk about category three, which is hyperacidity. So some of the symptoms that are related to this, and if you go to my website, make sure that you um, download or, or take the questionnaire. This is the metabolic assessment questionnaire. And basically follow along and look at category three. And if you have these symptoms, then this is an indication this might be going on with you. Um, Hyperacidity symptoms uh, are stomach pain, burping and uh, aching one or four hours after eating. Uh, do, you f do you frequently use antacids, um, feeling hungry an hour or two after eating, heartburn when lying down or bending forward, uh, temporary relief from antacids uh, or food like milk or carbonated beverages, um, digestive problems subside with rest and relaxation, heartburn due to spicy foods, chocolate, citrus, pepper, alcohol, and caffeine. Hyperacidity, now you're going to get your head around this in just a second. Hyperacidity is often associated with hypochlorhydria that has progressed to the point in which the lining of the stomach has been destroyed. So this is really weird, I know, but hang with me here. In cases of hypochlorhydria, which means insufficient hydrochloric acid, proteins don't get digested due to lack of HDL and subsequently putrefy. Okay, so stay with me. The putrefaction of protein creates a very acidic environment in the stomach that may lead to stomach lining damage and ulcers. So if you have both categories of hypochlorhydria and hyperacidity involved, always suspect that the cause of hyperacidity is second to hypochlorhydria and protein putrefication. Adequate levels of stomach acid are required to close both the esophageal and pyloric sphincters. So let me just tell you the way that works a little bit. You got your esophagus and you got your stomach and it's connected by a sphincter. Okay, this sphincter that we refer to is gastroesoph uh, is gastroesophageal uh, sphincter. We call it the cardiac sphincter as well, but that's because it's close enough. But anyway, all right. So this sphincter is actually meant to stay closed. And what keeps it closed, what triggers that close, is a high, strong gastric juice. So when you have a weak gastric juice, that sphincter actually weakens and goes in reverse. So if the esophageal sphincter does not close tightly, gastroesophageal reflux, or what we call GERD, 
may occur as gastric juices pass up the throat. So you've heard of acid reflux. Another technical term for it is GERD, and that's what it means, gastroesophageal reflux. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, the irony of what typically doctors would give you is an antacid, an antacid for GERD or for reflux. Now this may solve the, the symptoms, um, you know, but it won't fix the problem. Actually, as we said, the problem is hypoacid, hydrochloric acid, not hyper. So uh, if you take an antacid, here's the problem in the long run. It doesn't fix the problem, and remember, it is that strong gastric juice that breaks down protein. Protein is the building material for the body. Remember, protein, everything you see, hair, nails, skin, tissue, blood, white blood cells, hormones, uh, neurotransmitters that make our serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine and all of those, these are all made of protein, basically. They're also fat, but we'll get into that later. But these are the building materials that the body needs. So if you suppress the protein digestion by suppressing the hydrochloric acid through an antacid, guess what's going to happen? Eventually, in the long run, your body's going to break down. What happens also is, and you've seen this with very, very ill pa patients that have either cancer or HIV or whatever, they have wasting syndrome. And basically, wasting syndrome is the body cannot get enough protein to make its amino acids, so it literally starts eating itself. It starts breaking down your own muscle to get the essential nutrients that it needs to make hormones and neurochemistry. Okay, so see the problem there. So actually what you need, and you know, you can, um, you can go to my website, which is www.advancedhealthinstitute.com for more information on this, but really what you need is more hydrochloric acid. Pretty strange, but all right. Our next section is category four. This is pancreatic insufficiency. Now, remember, we talked about uh, digestion starts in the mouth, it goes to the stomach, and then once it leaves the stomach, that acid food, that chyme, enters into the duodenum of the stomach, and the pancreas releases bicarbonate to neutralize the acid pH so that it can release its little Pac-Man. All right, that's the pancreatic enzymes, the digestive enzymes that basically release to continue breaking down the food into its components before it absorbs into the gut. All right, so some of the symptoms of pancreatic insufficiency are roughage and fiber cause constipation. Usually it's the other way around. It usually helps, but in this case, roughage and fiber causes constipation. Uh, another symptom is indigestion and fullness, which lasts two to four hours after eating. Pain and tenderness, soreness on the left side under the rib cage, excessive passage of gas, uh, nausea and or vomiting, stool, undigested, foul smelling mucus like greasy or poorly formed, uh, frequent urination, increased thirst and appetite, uh, difficulty losing weight. Pancreatic insufficiency will cause symptoms similar to hypochlorhydria, but the symptoms are generally exposed after starch ingestion versus protein ingestion, which would be hypochlorhydria. Okay? Most people that have pancreatic insufficiencies have, a, um, have it secondary to hypochlorhydria. So remember, if the food does not become acidic enough once it leaves the stomach and enters the small intestine, the duodenum, it will not trigger the release of pancreatic enzymes. And also, it will not trigger the release of bile, which breaks down fat, which we'll get to. And then hence, um, will hence induce secondary pancreatic insufficiency. So the first, the first cause may be hypochlorhydria, which would cause pancreatic insufficiency. Uh, pancreatic insufficiency also commonly occurs from chronic gastrointestinal exposure to pathogens such as bacteria, parasites, or yeast. In these cases, the pancreas is called into action. Now, hang with me here because this is really interesting. 
pancreas is called into action to release enzymes to support the GI tract due to an anti-inflammatory and protoleic enzyme nature. Now, let me explain this. These pathogens that we were talking about, bacterias, uh, yeasts, um, even things like um, pollens in the air, pathogens are typically protein-based. So what happens is, is that the body, in response to anti-inflammatory, will release its proteolytic enzymes. Now remember, we've talked about enzymes. Anything ending with an ASE is an enzyme. So if it's a protease, it's an enzyme that breaks down protein. If it's a lipase, it's an enzyme that breaks down lipids, fats, etc. Okay. So if these pathogens are protein based, then the body will release proteolytic enzymes to try and deal with the inflammatory situation. Now here's a little side note, and this is what clinicians very often use for inflammation. We use these pancreatic enzymes, these protease, okay, specifically protease, um, for for inflammatory problems, including things like arthritis. Now, one of the things that causes arthritis is, believe it or not, leaky gut syndrome. And how that works is if the intestinal lining of our stomach, remember we're talking about digestion and then absorption. Well, if we've eaten a diet of, um, you know, junk food and sugars and alcohol intake and over-the-counter drugs and uh, lots of antibiotics in our life, we've basically destroyed the integrity of those nice, tight little epithelial cells in the gut. And what happens is they get, uh, they're supposed to be slightly permeable so that the amino acids and the broken down food can then absorb through the gut. But if they get swollen and, and puffy, they sort of puff up and they create these big gaps. And with those big gaps, we get proteins that have not been broken down, these big protein molecules that don't get broken down into amino acids and they slip through the gut and into the bloodstream. Well, our immune system does not recognize that protein as a friend. So it sends an immune response to take care of the enemy. Well, the problem is, is that our first line of response is inflammation. So very often, for example, uh, if we have arthritis, we have synovial fluid around the joint. And basically, that if we have fluid actually through our lymph system and we have trapped plasma proteins in there, the body sets up an inflammatory response that creates um, pain and swelling. All right. So one of the things that we use is we use these pancreatic proteolytic enzymes for inflammation. Now, a key note here is you don't want to take these with meals because what it'll do? What will it do? Well, obviously it's going to digest your protein. So basically what you want to do is if you're going to use these therapeutically, you want to use them before meals, an hour before or two hours after the meal. Uh, very often I've used these proteolytic enzymes for abscesses and acute uh, inflammation or infection. They work very, very well, especially upper respiratory um, infection and things like that. So there are other things, including your probiotics, that you want to use for inflammatory. But that is why we can also end up with pancreatic insufficiency. If we start, if we're in a chronic inflammation state, we're constantly using up these pancreatic uh, enzymes. Primary pancreatic insufficiency is often due to diets high in starch with patients that have some type of blood sugar regulation disorder. Digestive enzyme supplementation should be considered. And also you would consider your probiotics, which we talked about before, and possibly um, hydrochloric acid, especially if you're older. So that's my story. This is um, uh, about, again, Section 3 and Section 4, hyperacidity and um, pancreatic insufficiency. We're going to continue on in this journey. We've got um, quite a few. I think we've got probably 11 more to go. So make sure you stay tuned. If you haven't uh, signed up for Psyche Truth, make sure that you sign up. And you can contact me at www.advancedhealthinstitute.com for more information on any of these subjects. I'd be happy to uh, get back to you 
check out my website and we'll see you next time. If you liked this video, we have hundreds of more alternative videos ranging from sexual health to psychology to mind control. So if you liked it, go ahead and click on me to enter the Psyche Truth channel.